We're uh, discussing, of course, uh, ancient Egypt, which I have already, you know, started on. Uh, I think I've covered like the early history of Egypt. I think we covered the background of Egypt, the geography of Egypt. Um, I also talked about uh, the, the unification under um, King Narmer or Menes, talked about the gods of Egypt. I think the last thing I did was I talked about mummification. So that's the next thing, of course, I'm going to get into after that, because I'm going to talk about the old kingdom and the age of pyramids. So that's the big thing. So I think I had kind of just started on a little bit, maybe just talking about it uh, overall. And um, let me blow this up for you. Uh, the age of pyramids, uh, why is it called that? Uh, because of its extensive tomb building that takes place, uh, mostly through like the third up to like the six dynasties. Those are the, the ones that were peak ones that built probably the most pyramids, or the best pyramids uh, overall. All these uh, pyramids were built to, of course, house the mummies and their treasure uh, for the pharaohs, uh, of course, in Egypt. So that's why they refer to it as being called the Age of Pyramids. Uh, roughly close to about 80 pyramids were built in Egypt total. Um, and so all this was built during the Bronze Age, which is amazing. Uh, the fact that they, you know, mostly built these pyramids using bronze technology and stone. So they didn't have like iron or anything, other kind of technology. And you'll see later that they didn't even have like pulley systems and other lever systems that I think Herodotus sometimes talks about more or less. Old Kingdom was ruled by several dynasties. I kind of give them on the screen again, but third, fourth, fifth, sixth dynasties are usually the main ones uh, that are part of the Old Kingdom. Sometimes they do include, for some reason, the 7th and the 8th dynasties. It's kind of a debate about which ones are actually in the Old Kingdom. And um, the um, most famous was built by the 4th dynasty. They, they had the peak best pyramids that were constructed. These are often called the Giza pyramids or Great Pyramids, uh, which are built near Cairo. Uh, and, of course, the Great Pyramid was the largest one that was built, uh, which is the one that you can, uh, I don't know if you can see that picture right there, but I believe it's the one that's on the right uh, in that picture. It's kind of hard to see, uh, but the one over here on the right is the Great Pyramid. The one in the middle is the Pyramid of Khafra, and the one on the left is the Pyramid of Benkari. Those are at Giza, the Giza Plateau, uh, as they call it. Now, I have numerous slides, you know, on some of this stuff in here, if you want to look at them later. We'll talk about Emotep uh, to built in a bit from that video. He was the one, of course, that was one of the first uh, really built the first step pyramid. But the Egyptians didn't start building pyramids yet. That was something that would take a while to kind of evolve uh, over time. Uh, Egyptians, um, let me first talk about this first. Egyptians actually buried their pharaohs, officials, and also, he says, nobility there, what they call necropolis sites. These are cities of the dead that the short little video kind of mentioned about. Most of these were built on the west bank of the Nile. Reason for that uh, is because uh, in Egyptian mythology, the belief was that when you died, your soul went to the west where the sun went down. Because uh, the belief was that Ra was the eternal God, and that when um, when night came, Ra would travel through the underworld and then re be reborn the next day when the sun came up. So the belief was that souls went to the west where the sun went. Uh, and so all the different famous necropolis sites you see in that list on the bottom, Abydos, Saqqara, Maidam, Dashur, Giza, even the Valley of the Kings, were all built on the West Bank uh, in ancient Egypt. And, of course, most of the ruins, of course, are still there. A lot of these sites have pyramids, of course, except for the Valley of the Kings, which was like a rock-cut tomb-type um, necropolis site, which was built into a mountain mountain area, mountainous area. Uh, the oldest type of tomb that the um, Egyptians built was called a mastaba. 
uh, or mastaba. It's pronounced either way, I believe. Uh, and it's a type of mud brick tomb uh, where they build burial chambers underground. Uh, and because you can see on the bottom there that the nickname of it, it either means in Arabic, either a uh, mud bench or stone bench, because the fact that it looked like something you could sit on like a bench, and it was made of mud brick. Uh, so hence the name uh, being used. Also, the Egyptians had their own name for it, which is either House of Eternity or Eternal House, University either way. And the um, Egyptian name was pronounced Perzit. Yeah, Perzit or Perzit. One of the two, how they said it. Uh, and uh, the belief was that these tombs would allow, um, I guess, uh, you know, the, the person's mummy uh, to you know, survive forever uh, so that their soul would be destroyed uh, in the afterlife. Because the belief was that, you know, uh, the soul had, the body had to be attacked, your soul to, to survive uh, in the next world, whatever. Uh, and I've got some other pictures to show you. Of course, uh, the of course after Mastabas. Of course, here's an outline of kind of what a Mastaba looks like. So they would build some kind of superstructure on top of it and dig a shaft down uh, where they would put the burial chamber. You can see underground. So that's how they built like early Mastabas, uh, basically. They have many of these. They they of course have in Egypt that they've kind of rebuilt. Here's one, of course, right here. Uh, that's basically near what it's called, Dashur. Uh, and so, yeah, there's some there. I think there's some around Saqqara, Giza. They've got some uh, also as well. These actually were built all throughout Egypt. Uh, I want to say up through later, the late period of Egypt, like the post-Empire period, they probably built them as well. But during the old and new kingdoms, they pretty much had them built, you know, uh, all over the place. All right, let me move on to talk about the third dynasty uh, under King Joser, or Zoser, as they say it also as well. Uh, he, of course, uh, was an important king uh, because what happened was in the third and fourth dynasties, they went to building pyramids. So it's kind of like this evolution where they went from mastabas to pyramids. And there's two types of pyramids they built. They built what they call a step pyramid, which has steps to it, like kind of like a wedding cake which the third dynasty invented. And then the smooth-sided pyramid was something that was developed by the fourth dynasty, which came after. All the pyramids were made of stone. That's the thing about it that's different. They started building stone buildings out of these tombs. Uh, the outside was made of limestone, and, and pretty much the interior of most pyramids were made of more expensive granite, which was harder to cut uh, than limestone was. Uh, so that's a statue of King Zoser, who's also sometimes called different names, like Necherket, I think is another name. He was either the first or the second king uh, of the third dynasty. It's kind of a debate about that. Uh, about, he could have been the founder of it, but they're, I think they're kind of unsure about that. You can see he reigned in the 27th century B.C. Uh, and... Um, his pyramid he constructed, it's called all kinds of names. The most common name it's called is the Pyramid of Zoser or Joser, uh, built in the 2600s BC. And it was a six step pyramid uh, that they built. And of course, in the video, they went into detail uh, a little bit about uh, the man that constructed it. Uh, his name was Imhotep. And Imhotep was believed to be some kind of um, priest uh, and chancellor. Uh, that was under King Joser, uh, and um, they think he was a polymath. He was a genius of some type who evidently knew a lot of things like math and science, engineering. Uh, they think him. They think, they think he was also the, the so-called father of uh, Egyptian medicine. I believe they they nicknamed him uh, later. And uh, if you know about it, they made movies out of him. If you, if, if, probably, I don't know if you ever seen some of those mummy movies, The Mummy and all that, but um, pretty much one of the main evil characters that's in, you know, the mummy movies is Evo Tep, you know, which is, you know, kind of funny today, but it has nothing to do probably with the with that time period. But um, that's basically something that they kind of invented later. 
I do have pictures uh, of the pyramid. Let me see if I can, I can pull those up. But I've got, I think, more than one. But here's, here's, of course, the main picture. Yeah, it is the oldest stone building in the world, still standing after, you know, four or 5,000 years old. Uh, and, um, yeah, it's about 200 feet tall. I think the real stat on it uh, is that it's about, 203 feet tall. That might be the real height, but it's kind of rounded off to 200 feet tall. It's not square on the base like, you know, most pyramids are. Uh, it's usually, it looks like it's about 400 times, yeah, 410 feet by 358 feet. So it's like a rectangular base uh, to it. And um, the base on the bottom, I guess the first step they put on it, it's kind of falling apart. Uh, you can see but they are trying to kind of reconstruct it, uh, which you saw in the video. I think that's a more later picture probably than the one you're looking at. That might be a little older, that picture, what you're looking at right there. Uh, it did include some kind of mortuary temple. It was also part of it uh, as well. Now, I do have like some other pictures, like showing an outline of it and how they think it evolved. And so they think that what happened was it, it likely – a ball from stacking up stone, like multiple uh, layers uh, until they got the six step pyramid. And from there on out, they, they built several of these step pyramids uh, at what is Saqqara. That's the location of actually where it was built. Saqqara, which is near uh, Memphis, which is Memphis like near Cairo. All right, so yeah, I, I talked about King uh, Zoser or Joser of the uh, third dynasty. Now they have another king, uh, King Sneferu, who's part of the fourth dynasty that they have later. Uh, and um, that one, of course, is more famous. Um, what all this stuff is here, but. Um, some stuff on here I get to get rid of, if you don't mind. Anyway, um, but at, um, anyway, um, King Snafru, Snafru, of course, is um, he was famous for building multiple pyramids, uh, the red and the bent pyramids, of course, uh, and uh, of course the red pyramid became more famous later that they have overall, uh, and um. We'll talk about the red. I'll talk about the red a little later. Let me first talk about the bent pyramid. The bent pyramid, of course, uh, is considered to be one of the first smooth-sided pyramids that was constructed um, in the world. Here's a picture, of course. I think I've got several pictures of, of some of the pyramids. Here's, of course, the first one showing all the different pyramids. There was one called the Midum Pyramid uh, that may have been built uh, and... Um, they're not sure if it was his or not, but the other two they think he definitely built for sure uh, at a site called Dashur, uh, which is south of Cairo. Uh, there, of course, is a picture of the Bent Pyramid showing like the smooth-sided uh, face of it. Here's a better picture from a lot farther distance away showing the, the actual Bent Pyramid uh, right here. Uh, and... Um, that one, of course, uh, ended up being, of course, not used by him. Of course, he, he wouldn't use it as his tomb. Uh, and talk a little bit about this pyramid. It's, of course, called Bent Pyramid because it's known for having a strange bent shape to it. It was built with two separate um, actual slopes to it, like the angle of the slope of the pyramid. Uh, the bottom slope is about 54 degrees. And then the upper slope is about 43 degrees. They think it was built like that on purpose um, because they think that as they built the pyramid up, uh, they realized it was going to be too steep. Uh, so, um, so anyway, um, they end up, I guess, narrowing it at the top so it wouldn't collapse. But the pyramid ended up being abandoned. Well, I guess probably because of a strange shape. And maybe I think they say it may have been starting to fall apart, I think, after he built it because it was unstable. Uh, and so they abandoned that one. They didn't actually end up 
of course, using that one. It is about 332 feet tall. I wouldn't worry about that one as much. But this one, the other one, of course, I will show you, which is even more famous, is the so-called Red Pyramid. By the way, they're called different names. Uh, the Red Pyramid is sometimes called the North Pyramid. And then the other one, which is the Bent Pyramid, is sometimes called the South Pyramid because they're north and south of each other at Dashur. Yeah, that one, of course, was the first true pyramid uh, that was ever constructed. Uh, they do call it the Bat Pyramid, which is true because it is known for having bats living uh, inside of it. Uh, and it is the third tallest pyramid in ancient in, in, in Egypt today. Uh, that's still around. Uh, the other two, of course, are the Great Pyramid and the Pyramid of Khafre. So it's third tallest, 345 feet tall so is the original height of the Red Pyramid. Uh, and um, it is considered to be the first successful smooth-sided pyramid because eventually what happened was Snefru used this as his tomb. Uh, and um, why do they call it Red Pyramid? Well, it's dubbed Red Pyramid because they used local limestone nearby uh, that had uh, reddish uh, iron ore in it. Uh, and so hence it got the name Red Pyramid. Uh, and um, But you, originally it had its white limestone on top of it. Like because uh, all the they think at one point all pyramids had white limestone that covered it uh, pretty much, uh, and um, they think it had some kind of top on it. Usually pyramids would have some kind of um, permidian they would put on top, or what they call it capstone that they, they would put at the top of it. And most capstones were made of granite, whereas most of the lime, uh, most of the pyramid below was made of limestone. They say that the top of the pyramids may have been engraved in gold. At least that's in theory uh, about it. Because, um, But some capstones, uh, a lot of them were tore off later, like this one you're looking at right here in the, uh, it might be in the Cairo Museum in Egypt. But um, it's all like the Great Pyramid, I think is, I think that one might be missing, if I'm not mistaken, about that one. So, yeah, the Red Pyramid was pretty, pretty important. You know, that one, of course, would eventually lead to, uh, of course, the Great Pyramid later. Uh, its slope, I guess, was kind of similar somewhat uh, to the Great Pyramid, although the Great Pyramid is more steeper uh, in design. All right, let me move on next. And, of course, I do need to talk about, of course, the most famous of the pyramids that were, of course, constructed, which is, of course, the Great Pyramid of Giza. Uh, that was built by King Khufu, who was also called Cheops. Uh, King Khufu, of course, was the son of King Khafri. Excuse, excuse me, excuse me, the son of um, King Sneferu. Get my kings but mixed up there. So he's the son of King um, Sneferu. And um, uh, Khufu um, would end up starting the Giza complex. The Giza complex, of course, is a massive necropolis site near Cairo, which will uh, basically build three major pyramids, which are called the Giza pyramids. And uh, it include also a huge burial complex of like people that were nobility, um, royal officials, even some of the workers will be buried there uh, at that site. And, of course, the Great Pyramid was the largest pyramid ever constructed uh, in ancient Egypt. You can see the original height of it may have been close to 480 feet. Although I think it may be a little taller than that, maybe 480 to 485. And it has been stripped down. So you can see the top of it has been stripped uh, some a little bit, about maybe 20, 30 feet or so. Uh, and then each side is about 756 feet. That's a lot. That's a huge area uh, that you're looking at. The Great Pyramid is so massive in size that you can literally fit multiple famous buildings in there. Uh, like you could put probably the U.S. Congress in there. You could put St. Peter's Cathedral. You could put um, the Co Roman Coliseum. Uh, you could put Yankee Stadium in there. You know, just name something decent size. Uh, it would probably still all fit in there. 
Uh, so it's a huge area. I think like 13 acres in size is how big uh, the uh, area is where the actual base of the, the Great Pyramid is. So yeah, yeah, King Khufu, also called Kiops, like I said, son of Sneferu, uh, the guy that built the Red Pyramid, uh, like I talked about. Um, and I got multiple slides on here if you want to look at them later that I've got. Um, like here is actual a map of the Giza Pyramid Complex uh, close to Cairo that you're looking at. Uh, you can see those are the three main pyramids of Egypt, Pyramid of Khufu, Pyramid of Khafre, and the Pyramid of Benkari. So that's basically um, ones. You can see there are all kinds of other buildings there, mastabas, smaller pyramids and tombs uh, that are nearby. They also have the Great Sphinx or Sphinx, uh, which is that famous statue I'll talk about, uh, which is also in Egypt as well. Now, I'll get more uh, into uh, talking about King Khufu, of course, uh, in, the, in the Great Pyramid. Uh, other statistics about the pyramid, which uh, you might want to know about. The pyramid took about 20 to 30 years to build. Uh, one of the first, of course, uh, writers to really chronicalize the story of how it was built was Herodotus. Herodotus, of course, in book two of the histories, was the first really described it. Uh, Herodotus claims that slaves were used. Maybe 100,000 uh, may have been used to build it. But that's been disproved. They now think that that's not true at all, that skilled labor uh, was used uh, to basically work on the pyramids. Uh, and um, they do think that in the Great Pyramid itself, there were about 2.3 million stone blocks uh, that were used uh, to build the pyramid. It's a lot. Uh, I think the average um, stone weighed about two to three tons. So if you add that all together, I believe it's something like almost six million tons uh, or something like that. Uh, it was the weight, uh, the amount of that went into the actual building of the pyramid. Uh, it is famous for being, uh, I'll put it up here, by the way, again, but it is one of the only surviving um ancient seven wonders of the world. It was the first one, of course, supposedly built. Uh, it's the only one that survived uh, from a long time ago. Uh, so that's something to feed itself. So it's not much moving it right now uh, going anywhere. Um, now, how do they build it? Uh, besides using skilled workers, uh, they do believe that some kind of ramping systems were used uh, to move stone blocks into place likely mud brick ramps, which have been proven uh, at certain sites that they did do this. Like at the Temple of Karnak, they do believe that they use some kind of mud brick type ramping systems. They did not have draft animals though. So they, they, they weren't able to use like animals to move like oxen or whatever to move uh, blocks into place. So likely, you know, mostly what they used uh, of course, was um, brute human force. Uh, and so a lot of these workers, it was like back-breaking work. Uh, literally, a lot of them, it shortened their life lifespan, uh, you know, doing, doing this work. But a lot of them actually liked doing it. Uh, it was kind of like this huge national project, you know, to, you know, help bury the, the king and all this. And so a lot of people wanted to do it. Uh, a lot of people were paid either money or rations, I think primarily. And uh, a lot of the farmers I know, um, like during the off season, when they have the flood season, that's a lot of times when they would do a lot of work on these pyramids. But pretty much it was done round the clock, 24 hours a day, that they built these pyramids. Because uh, this one took a long time to obviously build. But yeah, Herodotus, Herodotus had his own theories, like they use lever systems and pulley systems and or scaffolding, but none of that existed yet, uh, which is pretty impressive, you know, for that time period. Now, the interior of the pyramid is um, also unique, too. I think I've got a picture showing the outline of it, but it has it is one of the very few pyramids that has multiple chambers in it. There's actually like three, three or four main chambers in it. 
Uh, there's a false tomb chamber, uh, which is on the bottom, uh, which they think that may have been put in there to fool um, tomb robbers, which didn't work. Uh, they still robbed the pyramid. Uh, the queen's chamber is a smaller chamber near the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, there was a theory about that, that it may have been used to bury one of his wives in there, uh, like a chamber for her mummy. They're not sure about that. That's true. Uh, some people think they may have put a statue of the uh, king in there, which represented his ka, but they're not sure about that either. So they don't know. Uh, there's also this huge grand gallery running up, like a hallway that runs up uh, to where the main king's chamber is, which you see right here. Uh, and um, you can see that the uh, it's been totally robbed. The whole thing was robbed. Uh, they broke into the actual sarcophagus. They even took the mummy, apparently, uh, the tomb robbers. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, and, um, and you can see there's no writing on the walls, which is something that's kind of unique about a lot of the early pyramids. You, you see graffiti later, I think, when people go into it later. But other than that, there's no writing on the walls until really the fifth dynasty is when they start writing on the walls and all that. So anyway, that's, that's, that's of course, you know, the famous... Um, you know, Great Pyramid uh, and all that. There are like other mysterious things about the pyramid I will mention briefly about, you might know about. Uh, there's all these kind of air shafts running through it, uh, which you see in that picture. Uh, and um, of course, there was a belief in there theologically that the air shafts were put in there so that the king's soul could leave the pyramid and go to the next world or maybe come back. Um, and, um, and they've actually sent robots in the some shafts that are in the pyramid. They have actually found other chambers in it, but we're not sure what's really in the rest of the pyramid, unless they take it apart, that kind of deal. Now, they have another great pyramid, of course, they're called the Pyramid of Khafre or Khafre's Pyramid. Uh, that's well known. Uh, this one, of course, uh, is the second largest ever built, of course, in Egypt. The second, second largest constructed pyramid uh, it's about 470 or 71 feet tall. Uh, it's about how tall it is, uh, with the width being about on each side 705 feet. So it makes about 12 or 13 acres uh, in size. Uh, and uh, Khafre, who's also called Khafren, was, uh, of course, Pharaoh of Egypt after King Khufu died. Uh, he, of course, was the son of King Khufu. There's a story that he may have actually finished his father's pyramid because it took so long, and then he built his own pyramid. Uh, and um, this one was not as fancy, but it is known for, you can see in that picture, for having the upper limestone casing, the white limestone casing, still intact. That's how you can tell the difference between Khufu's Great Pyramid and the Pyramid of Khafre. Uh, so it was that you know, upper upper part of the casing still there. Uh, and so those two, like I said, were the largest ever constructed uh, in ancient Egypt. Now I'll get to later, like the theories on, you know, what Herodotus thought about those two, uh, you know, kings that, that built these pyramids. I'll, I'll mention a little bit about that later, uh, about that. But let me move on and also talk about something else that's right in front of it uh, that's well known. Uh, as well. They have the so-called Sphinx, also called the Great Sphinx. It's called either one. Uh, and of course, that's considered, if you know about it, one of the most mysterious things, of course, that was ever built at the Giza complex or in Egypt overall. Uh, and it's believed that the Sphinx is a type of royal statue that was built by the fourth dynasty. Uh, they think it was built by King Khafre or Khafren for maybe his father. Um, so they think it was built to kind of honor him because he had, you know, built this burial complex or started it. So they think that the um, head of it was uh, King Khufu or, or Cheops. Uh, and then the rest of it, you know, was the body of a lion. So it represented the king's power, you know, how ferocious, you know, a king is uh, and all that, like a lion is. Uh, and so uh, I do have the, I don't even know the measurements of it, but that's the, the measurements of it. So it's about 241 feet long uh, to the top of the head. 
like where the forehead is and all that. It's about 66 feet tall, and the width of the base of it is about 63 feet feet, feet wide. Uh, and they believe it was built out of some kind of natural outcrop of limestone that was already there. It wasn't something they moved there and they built it or whatever. Uh, there was something naturally there, and they constructed it. And uh, but it's been, it's it's a very interesting statue because it's gone through a lot of disrepair uh, over the years. Uh, it's also been buried multiple times, uh, like many times. Uh, in ancient times, I know during the New Kingdom it had been buried. I think King Tutmos the Fourth unburied it. It helped him become king of Fer a king of Egypt at one point. Uh, during the Greek times, it was buried too again, uh, apparently. Uh, also, there, it doesn't have a nose. Uh, if you know about it, I think in modern times, soldiers would take shots at it with rifles uh, or guns, uh, and they blew the nose off of it. So it doesn't have a nose uh, anymore. Uh, it is sometimes called Father of Terror or Father of the Terror. Uh, it's, of course, people were superstitious of it. Uh, like No matter where you're at, but you're around it, it looks like it's staring at you. So whoever the artist was who built it uh, made, did a pretty good job in uh, making people um, think it's staring at them. Uh, and I think there's a theory that they may have, the Egyptians may have built it uh, to basically, um, it, may, it may have been, it may have been built to uh, scare tomb robbers away and guard over the pyramids, but they're, they're not sure about that. Um, so it didn't, because it didn't do a good job of it. <laughs> obviously, it's like a big watchdog, you know, sitting around. But it didn't obviously do anything to it, you know. Uh, there's a legend, too, of the Sphinx, which I think is just comes from the Greeks and all that. Have you ever, what was that uh, story about the Sphinx, uh, which is in the Oedipus Rex play? You may have heard, heard of that play. Uh, there's a story about, you know, if you're a traveler coming through here and uh, you you came upon the Sphinx. The Sphinx would ask you a riddle. And if you couldn't answer the riddle, it would destroy you, like eat you. Uh, so that's probably just a legend that they made up, you know, about it. Uh, they also have a smaller pyramid, which was built by uh, King uh, Menkari, also known as, uh, they call it Mike Karanos uh, as well. This pyramid is much smaller compared to, to the other two here, we'll slide on the bottom there for you. But third largest pyramid at Giza, so it's one of the three Giza pyramids. Yeah, it's real small, 215 feet tall, it may have been the original height, 339 feet on each side. So compared to the other two, it's puny uh, in size. And uh, he actually reigned longer. He could have built he could have built a larger pyramid, but apparently um, Minkari built a smaller one. There's different theories on why. It was built smaller. Herodotus claimed that um, the two previous kings, uh, pharaohs of uh, Khufu and Khafre, had been these uh, tyrants and made their people build these huge tombs. And then he says that Menkari, or Mykernos, was more benevolent. He was a nice ruler, didn't want to build this huge you know, tomb and all that. And that's why he did it. Of course, the other thing they theorize is that they think that the building of the other two, of you know, the Great Pyramid and uh, Khafre's Pyramid, may have bankrupted the country. And so they didn't build uh, that one so big. They didn't have the money. Uh, so that's the theory about that. And some some pharaohs at that time still built Mastabas uh, as well. So, so anyway, yeah, uh, pyramid building continued. Um, it continued up to the Middle Kingdom. So, like, I think the Middle Kingdom, like the twelfth dynasty, that was the peak dynasty that really built, um, like, the last major pyramids. Uh, there was a king later named um, Amenemhat the first who built one of the last major ones. A lot of the later pyramids were not built as good, and they collapsed, or they just fell apart. Uh, but they may have built up to 80 pyramids uh, throughout ancient Egypt, uh, from the old to the to the Middle Kingdoms. Of course, I'll get to it later, but the Middle Kingdom, uh, excuse me, not the Middle, the New Kingdom did not build pyramids. They went more towards building like rock-cut tombs buried like in the Valley of the Kings. And I think they may have built some mastabas, but pyramids were not built much 
of course, later. I did have a few other pictures in here. Let's see. I do have, of course, a picture showing the difference uh, between the size between these two pyramids. The one on the left is Caffrey's Pyramid, the second, second Giza one. And then they have the other one on the right, which is Menkari's Pyramid. You can see that that, that pyramid is you know, much smaller compared to the other you know, two Giza pyramids. They have some smaller pyramids there, too, at the site of Giza. Like, they have these so-called Queen's Pyramids that were built near Khufu's Pyramid. Oh, there's another picture right here on the left there. Those were built for Khufu's wives, and I think the one on the far right was built for his mother. So that old thing with the Queen's Chamber, yeah, likely that that was used for something else uh, in that the, the Queen's or, like, mother, wives, or whatever, were buried outside somewhere in another tomb. All right, let me spend a few minutes reviewing uh, over what we've covered. Some of this we've already, I think, I don't think I've reviewed yet any of this stuff. I'll go back and look at this, and I'll kind of continue with some more lecture material uh, for also uh, ancient Egypt. Uh, let me first talk about uh, what are some geographic features that make the Nile unique. I told you the Nile's the longest river in the world, uh, almost 4,200 miles long. Uh, it's also unique for flowing from south to north, uh, flowing from the from the African equator, uh, Earth's equator in Africa to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, what famous quote is attributed to uh, Herodotus? Um, that, of course, is the famous quote, which was, Egypt was the gift of the Nile. Because Egypt, you know, the river led to the civilization of Egypt. What two tributaries form the main trunk of the Nile River? Uh, you've got the um, Blue Nile that starts in Ethiopia. The White Nile starts where Lake Victoria is. Uh, what were these Egyptian terms that are famous? Cataracts are the series of six waterfalls that the river flows down as it flows from the Sudan to Egypt. Uh, Kemet was the, the uh, ancient uh, Egyptian name or Egypt, which means the black land. Deshret was the ancient Egyptian name, what they call the red land, which was the desert unfertile areas of Egypt where most people didn't live. Uh, the main season of Egypt is called the Aket, which means inundation, but it's like the flood season that happens in the summertime. Um, they had two other uh, seasons, which was called the uh, Peret, which is the sowing season, and then Shamu, or Shema, Shema probably how they say it, uh, is the um, harvest season that would come after. Although Egypt had two harvest seasons, probably like in the you know spring, fall, like we kind of have um, you know, as well. What, a, what two Egyptian states emerged at the end of the Neolithic period? Uh, you had the um, upper, upper Egypt or upper kingdom uh, and the lower Egypt or lower kingdom. Uh, both both reside in two parts of Egypt. Uh, the upper kingdom of Egypt resided in the southern part of Egypt, like more toward the when the river you know starts, which is called Upper Egypt. And then the other state, the lower kingdom, of course, exists in the delta area of Egypt in northern Egypt, also called Lower Egypt. And it was reversed. Uh, the actual names and the geography. Which king unified Egypt? What was his Egyptian name? Uh, they called him King uh, Menes, like the Greeks. Uh, and then the Egyptians called him Narmer, King Narmer. What were some achievements of his reign? Uh, Menes or Narmer was the one that unified the two states in the one empire or one kingdom, which they think he did around the 32nd century. He also founded uh, Memphis, which became their main administrative capital of Egypt. Um, also, um, he also was one of the first to wear the um, double crown that all kings wore in ancient Egypt. Uh, what are the three main historical periods or uh, kingdoms of kingdoms of Egypt? Uh, of course, they're talking about the um, Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom. Uh, they have other periods, but that's the main ones I want you to know. And try to make sure you remember them in chronological order. So old, middle, new kingdoms uh, overall. 
follows the cult of Amun Ra. That was the main state religion of Egypt, uh, which was based on the god Amun, uh, which is well known. Uh, and Amun was the chief god of the Egyptians, uh, who was later merged with the sun god Ra. Uh, it was, of course, centralized at the uh, city of Thebes, you know, the temple of Karnak. Other gods I told you about were Anubis, uh, the jackal-headed god associated with the uh, dead and mummification. They had Horus, uh, the falcon god associated with kingship and war. I told you about Osiris and Isis. Isis was the fertility goddess uh, who was the mother of Horus. She was married to Osiris, who was the king of the dead uh, in, in Egypt, Egyptian religion. Uh, Osiris had a brother named Set or Seth, uh, who was a god associated with like deserts, storms, chaos, and infertility. Uh, they had Sobek, uh, the crocodile god, often associated with like Egyptian power, military power, uh, crocodiles. And then also the god Toth was another god or Toth, bird god associated with like wisdom, knowledge, medicine. Uh, hieroglyphs, like he's one that gave the Egyptians hieroglyphs, and also papyrus uh, to write, you know, on their language down, down on paper. Uh, what was mummification? Mummification is the Arabic nickname for the uh, Egyptian funerary practices, uh, where they buried their dead, uh, where they kind of like uh, embalm people. What was the origin of the term mummy? Mummy came from the uh, Arabic word mamiya, which was a type of substance that's similar to uh, asphalt. They call it tar pitch sometimes. Oh, another scientific name, if you want to know, is bitumen, B-I-T-U-M-E-N. They call it tar pitch or asphalt, which they think was used in the actual mummification process. Uh, what were some of the main processes of mummification? I told you one was they had to remove all the organs from the body, uh, except for the heart, which they kept in the body, which was used for the afterlife. Um, also, uh, they would um, bury the body in mineral salt to help with the preservation and drying of the body. Uh, it was called natron. It was a Greek term. It was a type of mineral salt that was gotten from the deserts nearby. So natron. And of course, they would wrap the body uh, in bandages, like usually linen. And, um, and then they would pour like some kind of uh, coating on the outside, which they think may have been made of the mamiya or the tar pitch. What was the nickname of the four gods that protected the canopic jars where the uh, organs went into? They were called the four sons of Horus. I wouldn't worry about knowing the gods. You already got enough to remember about already. <clears throat> what dynasties dominated the Old Kingdom? Uh, third, fourth, fifth, sixth dynasties. Those are the main ones that were famous that built most of the pyramids like during that time. Uh, and um, the fourth dynasty was the most famous one because of the Great Pyramid and all that and the Giza complex. Why is the Old Kingdom nicknamed the Age of Pyramids? Because they built a majority of the main pyramids that were the best constructed uh, in ancient Egypt. Uh, and like I said, the fourth dynasty built the best ones, which is the Giza pyramids near Cairo. Uh, what were Abydos, Saqqara, uh, Giza examples of in ancient Egypt? You can also throw in Midam, Dashur, Valley of the Kings. They're called necropolis sites, cities of the dead, where the Egyptians buried their dead uh, separate from where the living are. What were mastaba? Mastaba were these mud brick type tombs that were built in ancient Egypt. Um, they were built like a mud brick superstructure with a burial chamber that was built underground. Um, they started these like going back to the old kingdom. And mastaba was an Arabic term that meant, there's different translations, but it meant either stone bench or mud, mud bench. Uh, what dynasty and king developed the first step pyramid, Saqqara? Uh, that was, of course, King Zoser or Djoser. That was part of the so-called third dynasty. He went on to build the so-called pyramid of Djoser, 
uh, which is the first pyramid constructed and also the first stone building ever built. Uh, who is the architect that built it? Uh, it was a man named Imhotep, who was believed to be some type of um, Egyptian polymath, chancellor, and priest. Uh, he designed and built it. And so he was considered to be the father of the pyramids, uh, more or less, uh, like we saw from the video. Now, I have the other stuff later at the end of the uh, lecture. I kind of cut the review sections in half. Uh, so the rest of that I'll review later uh, more in the pyramids. Let me go ahead and move on for a little while. I'm going to also talk about next. I need to get into and discuss uh, the um, development of um, Egyptian writing systems, which they were kind of, of course, known for. Of course, one of the first things I need to talk about, of course, is Egyptian hieroglyphs that they're, you know, very famous for um, uh, overall. Uh, and um, let me bring up, of course, a slide on that just right here. Of course, we'll talk about later the so-called Rosetta Stone uh, that gets discovered uh, in ancient Egypt. Uh, and um, I'll get to that in a second about the Rosetta Stone, because that's the thing that really leads to the rediscovery of it. But Basically, hieroglyphs is a type of Egyptian writing system that was written on either stone or papyrus, which is kind of like paper. Which papyrus is a type of hedge plant that grew in the Nile Basin. Of course, the Egyptians thought that the god Toth or Toth had given it to them you know, to make this stuff. It's where the word paper came from uh, over time. So it's kind of a Latin term. I guess the Romans used later for it. And uh, hieroglyphs used a combination of logographs or like logograms uh, with syllabic and alphabetic type symbols being used. Uh, kind of like cuneiform was. Uh, and it has like a thousand characters or more. I think it varies on the amount, depending on the time and all that. But it was a very complicated language system. So uh, later, like very few people knew how to read uh, hieroglyphs. Um, at least in the some of the versions that they had early on. Uh, and um, you must have been pretty smart. Uh, and um, the term hieroglyphs uh, comes from Greek origins. It comes from really two words, hiero and the word glyph. So let's say hieroglyphs or hieroglyphic writing or something like that, we'll sometimes say. Uh, and the word hiero is a Greek word meaning sacred or priestly. It was called that because a lot of the high priests uh, in the actual Egyptian religion knew, you know, all these um, you know, languages, I guess, which is more than one version of it. And it glyph, writing or carving, is what it meant in Greek. It was written on stone or written on, you know, paper. And so hence the name of uh, being used. Uh, there were different versions of hieroglyphs. So they had that early version, and then they had cursive forms that were later developed because they, you know, could write quicker and led to, like, writing on paper and stuff like that uh, to be used on papyrus. And so uh, early on, like in the New Kingdom, they developed what they call hieratic, which is a cursive form of hieroglyphs. In the late period, they also had of Egypt, they had the so-called demotic cursive form uh, that was real popular, which I think that one was real popular with the uh, lower classes, stuff like that. They actually had a Greek version of hieroglyphs. When the Greeks came in, they took hieroglyphs and they merged with Greek. And they came up with what they call Coptic, which you may have heard of. Coptic is like uh, kind of a kind of a you know like a ver uh, like a uh, like a combination version of those two together using Greek letters. And it's still used in modern Egypt today. Like it's still used by, they think, the Egyptian Coptic church, you know, which is like a Christian church uh, that's in Egypt. Uh, and so Coptic proved to be pretty important uh, because it would be one of the key things that allowed uh, people later to translate hieroglyphs. Uh, hieroglyphs, of course, if you know about it, by the Middle Ages became a lost language. Uh, so uh, the, if you know about the Romans came in who were Christian, over time they wiped out um, the priests. They, I think they killed off the priests or they, they died off or they banned the religion and in, in, in the use of the language. Uh, and so people forgot how to actually read 
Egyptian hieroglyphs. And so throughout the Middle Ages, it was pretty much like that. Uh, until in early modern times, Napoleon Bonaparte, you know, the famous French general and later emperor of France, invaded Egypt in 1798. Uh, and what happened was some of his soldiers eventually found the famous Rosetta Stone in 1799, which you're looking at right there. Uh, this stone doesn't look like much, but it weighed about a thousand pounds. It weighed about, about close to half a ton. It's pretty heavy. They found it in the in the wall of a fortress in a town called Rosetta, which is in the Nile Delta in Egypt, the northern part of Egypt, which would be like the lower part of Egypt. It was found by this guy named uh, Pierre Bouchard. Now, we never heard of him, but I think his full name was Pierre Francois Bouchard. I believe he was some kind of engineer. He was a soldier, but he was an engineer type soldier. Uh, and he thought it looked important of some type. So he dragged it out. What they found out about it was that it was actually a, a ancient inscription on it that was from the reign of King Ptolemy V. He was the fifth king of the Ptolemaic dynasty. It's one of the last major dynasties that really controls Egypt later. And apparently it talked about uh, his uh, coronation, about how he was being crowned king uh, in Egypt. And so apparently every not everybody knew Greek or hieroglyphs, like both languages. Uh, and so uh, they wrote it in three languages, hieroglyphs, demotic, and Greek. Uh, and so that proved to be pretty much uh, the stone that would help to decipher the language, which, like I said, had been lost for, you know, um, hundreds of thousands of years. Nobody knew how to actually read it. Uh, there was a man that actually translated it. His name was Jean-Francois Champollion. He was actually the first man to successfully translate and read the Rosetta Stone, which they think was around 1822. They think Champollion was the one they believe that started really modern Egyptology. He kind of helped influence it. Uh, but they do think that Napoleon's invasion into uh, Egypt helped really bring in people that were interested in Egypt and also people that were fortune hunters looking to steal stuff, which Module did. And um, later, Napoleon's forces were actually defeated in Egypt. The British took possession of the Rosetta Stone they brought it back to uh, England, where it resided eventually in the British Museum in London. And that's where it still is today, it's still in the British Museum. And it's a very controversial topic uh, in Egypt. I know modern Egypt, they, they want it back. They want the Rosetta Stone. And the, um, the, uh, <laughs> the British won't give it back to them. Um, same thing with the um, Hammurabi Code, like the steel uh, but I think I showed you a little video clip on that before. Uh, the, the British have that too uh, in the in the, uh, Cairo, uh, the yeah British Museum. They still got it there. But both of them, they got a lot of stuff there. The British got that they took, they never gave it back. So yeah, that's a kind of a kind of a controversy issue. So I don't know what's going to happen with that. Uh, but one day maybe they give it back to them, I guess. But I, I doubt it. <laughs> that's my theory. Um, all right, I've got a few minutes left. Let me uh, continue, and I will talk briefly. Not too much. Of course, there are courses. I will get into the New Kingdom next. Uh, it's one of the things I'll, of course, be getting into. I did want to spend a few minutes, not much, talking about the Middle Kingdom. I don't usually spend much time talking about that period, but the Middle Kingdom did have like two or three dynasties that was in. It's kind of a debate how many it had. Uh, some claim it had 12 or oh, the 12th and 13th dynasties in it, and then some people think it goes up to the 14th dynasty. So it might have like 12th, 13th, and 14th dynasties uh, in it. The most famous dynasty of the Middle Kingdom was the 12th dynasty. Uh, it's famous for a king named Emma Nemet I. Um, and if you want to know when he reigned and all of that, but he reigned about, um, I think he reigned about, close to about the 21st century, roughly close to 2000 BC, I think is when he reigned. 
And he's actually uh, in his relatives that come after that are pharaohs. He's actually, they're actually the last um, pharaohs that actually build pyramids, like major ones. Uh, like he's got the pyramid of Am and Am at the first, which I think it's mostly rubble now. It's falling apart. But the Middle Kingdom uh, declined later. Uh, they believed there were uh, severe droughts. And then what happened was there was an invasion that came in where foreigners took over part of the uh, empire. And it led to a period which is very famous in, in history called the, the Hyksos period or Hyksos invasion period, uh, which is well known. It's either pronounced Hyksos or Hyksos. I think Hyksos is, might be the more um, popular way they say it in, in Greek, which is a Greek term, they believe. And... Uh, they believe it happened sometime around the 17th century. So in the 1600s BC, which would be like more than 3,500 something years ago, Asiatic peoples from like where Israel is and, and what is also Lebanon, which is called Canaan a long time ago, uh, entered um, Lower Egypt and they conquered it. They took it over. Uh, and they think they were Semitic in background. At least that's the theory they have about it, that they were Semitic. Um, there's a theory that maybe uh, they were related to the, to the Israelites or Hebrews, but that's still debated today about how they're related. You can see they brought in the war chariot you see in that picture there. So they had the war chariot, which enabled them to conquer drastic amounts of territory uh, throughout that region. Uh, and uh, they also brought in the composite bow or some kind of bow he's using. But they think it's the composite bow likely uh, that they're using that may have originated somewhere in Asia uh, overall. Uh, the main historian that gives us information on who the Hyksos were was uh, Flavius Josephus. He was a, um, a, Ro a Jewish Roman writer uh, that was writing about 2,000 years ago. He has a series of books. Well, he's got several books he wrote called the Jewish Antiquities and a bunch of other books like the Jewish War. And um, apparently he was able to borrow some kind of uh, Egyptian source uh, from a writer at the time named Manetho. And so Manetho was, they think, the original source who wrote about the Hyksos. He was believed to be some kind of uh, Ptolemaic priest uh, and um, some kind of historian of some type. He wrote a book, I forget the exact, it's different names they call it, but I believe it's called The History of Egypt. Well, it was originally called, but it doesn't exist anymore. It just has like fragments that are kind of written by, by, by Josephus. Josephus thought that they might be related to uh, the Israelites or Hebrews. And I think Josephus sometimes called the uh, Hyksos, he called them the um, shepherd kings because the Hebrews were known for being shepherds like tending sheep and stuff like that. But they're not sure if that translation is correct. There's all kinds of translations of the word hyksos from Greek. Uh, one, one translation you see there is uh, foreign kings or rulers of foreign lands because uh, you have these foreigners that were basically practically ruling over the country. Uh, and so um, that may be why the story of Moses occurs because, you know, Moses is supposed to be this Egyptian prince that's actually not Egyptian, but Hebrew. So it could be that, yeah, they may have been related somehow to the Hyksos or may have come in at the same time as the Hyksos. That's the, the theory that they, they think happened, but it's never been really proven for sure. What they do know is that the Hyksos were driven out by the 18th dynasty pharaoh named King Amos. You see in that, that's probably him in the picture I'm thinking maybe they're trying to show on the bottom there. But um, and that would begin a new period uh, in Egyptian history, which was called the New Kingdom. And the New Kingdom was a late Bronze Age period, uh, which stretched from Egypt, uh, Egypt and Sudan and Libya. And it stretches through Syria uh, and Israel, all those areas uh, in what is southwestern Asia. And it's an empire, by the way, that is massive. Uh, compared to the previous one, like the old kingdom was a much a much smaller state, and so was the middle kingdom. So Egypt under King Amos actually doubled in size 
uh, at that time. Uh, and so, so the new kingdom uh, would come in uh, at that point. Uh, and yeah, it's a golden age. It is true. It is a golden age of Egypt. Uh, Egypt pretty much peaks uh, during the late Bronze Age to early Iron Age uh, at that time. Some of the greatest pharaohs all lived uh, during the New Kingdom. Uh, the New Kingdom uh, had only three dynasties uh, that were actually part of it. They had the Tutmosid dynasty, which was called mostly pretty much the 18th dynasty. It was called that because of the fact that there were several pharaohs with the name Tutmos or Tutmosis that ruled. There was like four of them. But I think Tutmosis is the first being the most famous. I think he was the third ruler of the 18th dynasty. So the 18th dynasty is called the Tutmosid dynasty. The 19th and the 20th dynasties were called the Remesiad dynasties. And uh, they were called this because um, all the different pharaohs with the name Ramses uh, that existed. There was like 11 rulers with the name Ramses. And the most famous in the 19th dynasty was Ramses the Great. Uh, he's also called Ramses the Second. We'll talk about him later, but he was considered to be the greatest pharaoh probably of the New Kingdom period. Uh, the 18th dynasty, though, overall was the most famous uh, Egyptian dynasty. They know more about that dynasty than probably any other dynasty uh, in Egypt's history. Uh, let me also talk for a few more minutes, and I'll probably that'll be it for today. But New Kingdom uh, became famous for constructing the Valley of the Kings. That's one thing that's well known, of course, about ancient Egypt. And uh, if you go to this picture here, uh, you can see the Valley of the Kings was actually a mountainous area that's west of where Thebes or modern Luxor is today, where they basically cut out uh, what are, I guess, what they call rock cut tombs uh, in um, the Egyptians, pharaohs were hoping to hide the tombs of the, of the you know, uh, Egyptian pharaohs. But what ended up happening, of course, later was that they were all robbed. So around over 60 of them were built, at least 62 uh, were constructed, with King Tut's being one of the last one, of course, that they found. Uh, Thebes also, don't forget, was the state cult center uh, of the New Kingdom by then. Uh, it's where the you know the god Amun was practiced, of course, uh, the most, where the modern city of Luxor is today. So the Temple of Karnak was a massive temple that was constructed there that was built over successive uh, pharaohs, uh, not just one, but a bunch of them built it uh, over time. Uh, of course, today and also on um, Wednesday's class, I will be, of course, discussing about some famous pharaohs. Let me talk about at least one, uh, and that's it. And, and I probably won't have time to get into some other ones, but let me at least talk about Hatshepsut. I think I've got time to maybe talk about her a little bit, and I'll continue later if you want. But um, Hatshepsut um, was considered to be um, the only female pharaoh that they had in ancient Egypt. Uh, she, of course... Um, was actually the daughter of King Tutmos I. Tutmos I was interesting because he was the one that started the Valley of the Kings, like his, her father, sort of you know, burying people there uh, at one point. Uh, and so um, he had a son, but he died young. And so she ended up on the throne because she was a widow. Uh, and they did have a son, or they got a stepson that could have been the ruler, but... He was too young, and so she took over the whole you know, empire at that point, and she reigned like 20 years uh, as pharaoh. So she's one of the very few female pharaohs that you have in ancient Egypt. I think you got Nefertiti, and you got Queen Cleopatra. That's about it uh, for female pharaohs, uh, more or less. And she may have been the most powerful one of all three of them, but Cleopatra was pretty, pretty powerful as well. Uh, she did trade with parts of Africa, uh, like East Africa. They started trading with like Somalia, which was called Punt or Punt, P-U-N-T. Uh, then they think under her, they expanded into Sudan and also they think into 
what is um, likely part of Syria, at least up into where Israel is, they began expanding. Uh, she's very famous for her mortuary temple uh, that was built in western Thebes called Deir al-Bari. Uh, and uh, this was her temple that was built to honor the god Osiris, uh, the king of the dead. Uh, and it was known for its um, causeways that ran up to it. It had like three levels to it. And it's considered one of the most unique um, temples that was ever built uh, in ancient Egypt. It's, of course, been since built, reconstructed since, I think, the 20th century. And uh, the Arabs call it Deir al-Bari, uh, which means the uh, northern monastery because it may have been used at one point by the Coptic church of Egypt, like as a church and monastery originally. They do think it was built by this man named Sinemut, who was some type of royal steward and chancellor that was under her. He was some kind of architect uh, that was uh, well known uh, at the time. Here's a picture of it right here. Uh, and um, But it's been reconstructed, and that's kind of what they think it looks like anyway. So the only thing about Hepshepsut, yeah, Queen Hepshepsut is that, you know, a lot of people didn't like her being a female pharaoh, uh, you know. Uh, and so after she died, a lot of her monuments were actually defaced. Her statues were buried because uh, people didn't really want to, you know, um, have a female ruler as pharaoh. That was kind of controversial and probably still was later, uh, more or less. I'm running out of time, I think, for today. Uh, I prefer just to keep lectures around an hour and 15 minutes, but um, later I'm going to finish up Egypt uh, with the next lecture. I'll talk about Amenhotep IV. He's called Akhenaten, so I'll get into him. I'll talk about also um, what is um, King Tut. We'll get into uh, him as well. We'll talk about him a little bit. And I'll also talk about Ramses the Great as well. Kind of, And then I'll kind of spend some time reviewing uh, what we got left, uh, more or less. And so that's probably going to, um, you know, wrap up uh, my, my lecture today uh, overall. So before I go, um, uh, don't forget uh, about some of my announcements I've posted, of course. I've got a new Canvas quiz, of course, that I will, of course, post today, uh, which I'll I kind of didn't quite finish it all, but I'll have it posted today about Mesopotamia and get that done. And don't forget about prehistory, the canvas quiz on that. That's still open. I'll probably keep it open a couple of days until Wednesday. So that's it for today. I uh, hope you'll have a good rest of the week. Uh, and I'll have other lectures up, of course, on Wednesday later, of course, for the class. So y'all take care. So see you.